Good afternoon. For those of you who don't know me, I am Lynn Livesey and I'm a senior associate in the casualty team at Brodie's. We're joined today by over 100 guests from a variety of sectors, including in-house legal, insurers, claim managers and brokers. And there are some very familiar names on our sign up list. So hopefully with the restrictions easing, we'll be able to catch up in person soon. But for today, uh, we are delivering this session virtually and I'm joined by my colleague, Gemma Nicholson. And together we're going to give you our insights from defending the wide variety of claims arising from personal injury incidents. Thanks Lynn, and thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. The aim of the session is to consider five legal strands. The common thread between them is that they do not arise routinely. You may therefore be less familiar with their context and application. That they are less common is not, however, to dilute their importance. Each strand gives rise to lines of legal argument, which can be very important in the context of a liability claim. Notably, the lines of argument, if made, may allow a defender to limit or pass on a legal liability, which would otherwise attach. Alternatively, it may be that the line of argument will assist the pursuer in that it reduces the legal and or evidential hurdles which he or she must overcome to establish liability. If so, the risk profile of the claim will inevitably increase. Against that background, we will consider the factual scenarios which each legal strand is likely to feature and provide our view on what their application may mean to the claims handling process. There's a lot to cover. Each subject is vast in its own right, but we hope to take you through the five topics in about 35 minutes. For today's purpose, the key themes are of identification, application and response. So the first legal strand to be considered is the issue of control. Now the term control is used widely in the sphere of liability claims, but it does not have one meaning or definition. Indeed, what control is important or relevant to the assessment of legal responsibility will differ according to the nature of the claim made. You will see that when Lynn goes on to discuss control in an occupier's context later. For this discussion of control, I am thinking of its use in the context of a personal injury claim made by an employee against his or her employer for a failure to provide a safe system of work. And specifically, whether exploring the issue of control may allow that employer to limit their liability to pay. It is, of course, well established and known that employers owe to their employees a duty of care. The duty is to take reasonable care to protect them from foreseeable harm. Equally well known is that this legal duty is owed personally to the employee by the employer. It does not end if delegated to or imposed upon another person or organisation. In practice, this means that where the duty of care is breached and an employee is injured, the employer will remain liable to that employee irrespective of whether the employer did take part in or assume a share of the conduct of the work obligation. So if we think then of a factual example, that is where an employee is injured when working alongside or assisting a contractor in a joint effort to complete works at an external site. Where a person is injured in that scenario, they may make a claim against their employer. If they do, the employer cannot escape liability to the employee by saying that the duty of care had been delegated to or assumed by the third party company and improperly performed. The employer to the employee remains on the hook. Now that outcome arises because in the eyes of the law, the third party company is to the extent that it interacts with the employee simply an agent of the employer. This legal outcome does not, however, mean that the employer is, so to speak, stuck to pay the employee's claim in full, if indeed breach can be established. The employer may not be the only entity who did owe a duty of care to the injured person at the material time. It may still be possible for the employer to limit their liability. Crucially, it is recognised that workers can be acting under the factual control of a person other than their employer, and that as a result of such control, that person may also owe to them a duty of care. That duty can arise 
even where the nature of the work was very brief. The issue of control is therefore crucial to establishing that a duty of care did exist between the injured person and third party company, and in turn, vital to potentially reducing the liability of the employer. But what does the term control mean in that context? Well, there is no one size fits all statutory definition. Instead, the answer comes from previous decisions of the court. In that regard, there is an established line of authority which confirms that the relevant legal test to adopt is to ask who had a right to control the way in which the act involving negligence was done. So it is control over the way in which the task which gave rise to injury was undertaken that is essential. In practice, the key question to be determined is often narrowed to who was entitled to tell and did tell the pursuer how to do the work. Now, this is a question of fact. It can be answered only by looking very closely at the chain of events. From experience, it's very seldom answered by reference to documentary evidence. Naturally, safety documents such as risk assessments, programmes of work and safe systems of work as prepared by the employer and third party company should be recovered and reviewed, but often will not provide the necessary level of detail or certainty as to the exact chain of command for each and every part of the work task. Further, in many cases, the factual situation which surrounds the occurrence of injury is one which deviates from what was initially envisaged and agreed. For example, where the initial work plan has had to be dynamically revised due to practical or logistical constraints or time pressures, or where a pursuer has been asked on an ad hoc basis to help or of their own volition has offered to assist. In most cases, the issue of control is best explored by identifying all relevant personnel who were on site, highlighting those who worked with or alongside the pursuer with a particular focus on relevant foremen and peers, and obtaining statements from them to ascertain exactly what was happening on the ground at the material time. Crucially, who took charge of the system by which the task was to be undertaken? Now, this step can be onerous, but it is only once the exact factual matrix is known that the test relevant to the issue of control can be properly applied. Further, in most cases, because of the non-delegable duty, the third party company will typically resist offering any contribution until it is furnished with very clear evidence of on the ground control. Accordingly, if a contribution is to be sought by the employer, completion of detailed factual investigations is often unavoidable and as such best completed as early as possible when memories are fresh and relevant individuals can still be traced. The legal determination of whether the employee was under the factual control of another entity is therefore very fact specific. For that reason you should be cautious in placing too much reliance on previous case outcomes unless of course the facts are of an identical or very similar nature. However, there is one distinction made within existing case law, which I think is important and helpful to bear in mind. The distinction is where the injured employee is operating a complicated piece of machinery as against the provision of labour. The more highly skilled the task, the less easy it is to infer that the third party company did have control over the valuable piece of equipment. That is, control in the sense of being able to tell the workman how to work it. The more obvious conclusion is that the factual scenario is of two different entities carrying out two different roles, albeit perhaps for the same purpose. In contrast, when it is a matter of labour only work, there is more scope for the third party company to have been involved in the issuing of instructions and directions on performance. In that scenario, the employee may well during the course of the work have been personally subject to the factual control of the third party company, such that this entity does owe to him a duty of care. Overall, in the context of an EL claim for failure to provide a safe system of work, it can be stripped down to a relatively simple legal question. But to answer that question and in turn assess the potential for third party contribution, detailed factual investigations may be unavoidable and are best commenced as early as possible. Lynn will now look at control in the context of occupiers' legislation 
Thanks very much, Gemma. So Gemma's just gone through the issue of control in the employer's liability context. And as she's mentioned, I'm now going to consider control in a public liability setting. So you will all most likely be familiar with the primary legal authority, and that is the Occupiers Liability Scotland Act 1960. This act creates statutory duties. However, the legislation in effect mirrors the common law in this area. And the key duty under the act is set out in section two of the act, where an occupier of a premises has a duty to show care towards persons entering those premises. The act specifically states that this duty arises by reason of the occupier's occupation or control of the premises. So that's where control comes in. Under the act, an occupier must take reasonable care to ensure that persons on the premises will not suffer injury or damage as a result of the state of those premises. It's important to remember it's not an absolute duty and the onus does lie on the pursuer to prove the breach. So in order for a pursuer to succeed, they need to firstly prove that the defender was an occupier of the premises and then that there was a danger on or at the premises due to their state. If so, the defender is under a duty to take reasonable care to see that the pursuer isn't injured by reason of that danger. So section two sets out the legal test, but how does that actually apply in practice? Well, the first question really is whether the defender was an occupier of the locus and whether an, a party is an occupier for the purposes of the act is dependent on the circumstances. So as every claims investigator or indeed lawyer will tell you, each case really does turn on its own facts. But what facts do you actually need to establish to be able to assess who is an occupier and therefore who has legal liability for the claim? Well, firstly, it's important to remember that there can be more than one occupier at the same time. It could be your landowners, your tenants, contractors, you might be in a situation where a house builder has handed over premises to builders, but each might still be an occupier against a visitor who's injured with liability attaching to one or the other or both. It depends on the facts and circumstances of the case. But what's key is that there can be more than one occupier liable simultaneously. An occupier is one who occupies or has control of land or premises. And it's not necessary to have entire control of the premises. You don't need exclusive occupation. So it's possible for a premises to be within an occupier's control, but not exclusive control. So how do you go about determining who is in control? Well, title or ownership of a property will be a factor in determining control, but it's not essential. And what's a common theme throughout assessing all liability claims is a need to determine the facts of the case, as the facts will be what will determine who was in control of a premises. And so when you receive a letter of claim and you're considering next steps, what you want to be thinking about is, what do I know or what do I need to go and find out through my investigations to determine factually who was actually in control of these premises? And a key question when carrying out those investigations is considering who has the power to exclude others from the premises. The courts will consider that to be a significant factor in determining control, but again, it's not always decisive. So establishing whether a defender can permit access or remove people from the premises is one aspect to investigate. Control can also be established if Someone is entitled to take steps to make the land or premises safe. So that, again, is another aspect that is worth investigating. Another thing to consider is, in terms of liability is the liability on landlords. There's a special provision in the Act under Section 3 for leased property. And if a landlord is responsible for maintenance or repair of the premises, then they are an occupier. The lease should really assist you in determining who's an occupier in that setup because it should set out who's responsible for maintenance and repairs. 
So where you've got more than one occupier of a premises, each has a duty of care towards persons coming lawfully onto the premises, dependent upon their degree of control. If both occupiers are deemed to have breached their duty under the Act, the courts then need to consider how that liability is shared between the occupiers. The courts, again, will look to the degree of control when assessing this. It's not the case that liability is just simply split or apportioned on an equal basis based on the number of occupiers. <coughs> the courts will consider whether there was a main occupier who perhaps had greater liability than others. So identifying if there is more than one occupier can enable you to limit or pass either in full or in part legal liability. And whilst in gathering documentary evidence, such as things like a lease, can certainly assist in establishing the, who was actually factually in control of a premises. Often it's the witness evidence of those on the ground that Gemma's just talked through in terms of control in the workplace. Well, it's those witnesses on the ground in an occupier setting that again will be key to assessing who was in control and crucially to what extent. So I'm going to now turn to non-delegable duties. That's the next legal concept that I'm going to consider. And these duties are exceptions to the general rule that the duty to take reasonable care can be discharged by entrusting performance of a task to an apparently independent contractor. Gemma's touched upon the most commonly referred to non-delegable duty of care being an employer's duty of care towards their employee. As Gemma's explained, if an employer is delegating performance of that duty to another, such as a contractor, the employer remains liable if the duty is breached, since the duty is non-delegable. And that non-delegable duty does extend to the provision of a safe workplace and a safe plant. And these duties apply in addition to any vicarious liability that an employer may have as a result of their employee's actions. And vicarious liability is a topic really until itself, and it is something which is, there's been quite a lot of changes of, in, of the law in relation to that. In terms of the non-delegable duties, it's important to remember the other factual scenarios where non-delegable duties apply. And these duties can arise from statute and the common law. And categories where non-delegable duties have been considered or established include cases where an independent contractor has been engaged to perform some function which is considered either inherently hazardous or liable to become so in the course of the work. Hospital authorities and healthcare provision is another category where hospitals have non-delegable duties to patients in their care. And schools in terms of education is another setting where we've got children who are owed non-delegable duties of reasonable care by those who are entrusted with their supervision. So in circumstances where duties have been delegated, it is only where the employer or the entity can show that both it and the person who's been charged with performance of the duty exercised reasonable care to be able to establish that the duty has not been breached. But what if, if the duty has been breached? So if you've got a non-delegable duty, it exists and it has been breached, and therefore primary liability is going to rest with you as the defender. Well, there may still be scope for passing that liability to another, and that's where your investigations need to be undertaken to establish if the person discharging the delegated duty acted negligently or breached the term of contract. And if so, there might be scope to seek recovery or at least a contribution from the other party. So therefore, while you might have to admit liability to the pursuer, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't limit that liability by investigating matters in terms of the involvement and the acts of other parties. And if you have engaged a contractor, it's worth reviewing the terms of the contract because there might be an indemnity in the contract that can be relied upon. I've certainly had cases in the past where I've been able to do that very thing. And depending on the factual circumstances of a particular case, it might mean that it's still possible to pass on the vast majority of the claim spend to a third party, even where liability can be easily established against an employer or an entity with non-delegable duty. 
um, in, in previous negotiations, uh, I've managed to secure a 90% contribution where there, we are on the hook in terms of primary liability, but we've managed to pass on the vast majority of that to an independent contractor that's been engaged. And what's key, again, is the early exploration of the facts and the potential contractual indemnities to consider whether another party could be involved. Each case turns on its own facts but carrying out investigations at an early stage will enable you to assess whether there is any ability in terms of your claim spend to be passed on or, or restricted. So moving on to the final topic I'm going to consider today, and that is strict liability. As most listening will know, section 69 of the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act, which is commonly referred to as ERA, removed civil liability for breaches of the Health and Safety at Work Act and the subsidiary legislation. In effect, this removed strict liability in civil claims for breaches of the majority of health and safety legislation that pursuers previously used to base their claims on. And this change was favourable, um, particularly for us as who defending claims because it gave us the ability to defend claims where it could be argued that the duty to take reasonable care had been complied with. It's not to say that the health and safety regulations can be disregarded or are irrelevant because they are still referred to and relied upon by pursuers when they are supporting their common law case arguments. However, whilst the majority of claims now commonly rely upon a breach of common law, there are still strict liability arguments that can be made. And it is important to be aware of them as they reduce the legal hurdle that pursuers need to overcome to establish liability. And that therefore increases the claims risk profile. I'm just going to touch on a few today in terms of the strict liability strategies that we are seeing frequently. Um, and the first and probably most frequently used piece of legislation is the Employers Liability Defective Equipment Act 1969 and it provides that where an employer provides equipment and an employee is injured by a defect that even if there's been negligence by a third party the employer is found negligent and the purpose of that statute was to protect employees from defects in equipment in circumstances where those defects were attributable to the fault of some third party. The next piece of legislation uh, to flag is the Consumer Protection Act 1987. It imposes strict liability on manufacturers of defective products for harm caused by those products. It means that people who are injured by defective products can claim for compensation without having to prove that the manufacturer was negligent. They only need to prove that the product was defective and that an injury or damage was most likely caused by the product. And the, this act actually applies to both products used by consumers and products used in the workplace. And another thing to remember is that claims can be brought under this act by any person who is injured by a defective product, regardless of whether that person actually purchased the product. And the final piece of legislation that I am going to touch upon is the Offices, Shops and Railways Premises Act 1963. Now, this piece of legislation has largely been repealed by subsequent health and safety legislation. However, there are a couple of very specific sections of the Act that are still in force, such as the prohibition of heavy work preventing certain categories of persons from being required to lift, carry or move a load that's so heavy it's likely to cause them injury. And the categories of persons are set out in the Act and they can include members of a police force maintained by a local policing body or a police authority. I mention these Acts merely as an illustration of some of the strict liability strands that still apply today. It's important to remember this legislation is still in force in addition to the common law, as if introduced or relied upon by a pursuer, it can change the prospects of a case and increase the risk profile of a claim. I'm now going to pass you back to Gemma, who's just going to consider the final topic for today. Thanks, Lynn. Final topic is res ipsa locator. What is it? Well, it's not a legal principle, 
It's a rule of evidence which has been around for some time. Indeed, its application predates the decision in Donoghue versus Stevenson by 70 years. Personally, I would describe res ipsa as a non-standard approach to proving a fault case. It's one which is intended to operate in limited circumstances. Despite its age, it has not therefore historically been a common feature of liability claims. That said, within the last couple of years, pursuers do now seem to be turning more readily towards res ipsa as an evidential device. Why? Well, because when res ipsa applies, the pursuer's life is made much easier. It is commonly said that the onus of proof passes to the defender. However, that is not strictly correct. The onus remains on the pursuer to prove his or her case. So the facts of the accident do still need to be established. But in a res ipsa case, it is enough for the pursuer to point to a combination of facts and to say that a prima facie case of negligence can be inferred from those. If the court is persuaded of that, it is for the defender to lead sufficient evidence before the court to rebut that inference. So res ipsa brings about a shift in the evidential burden. From a defence perspective, the shift will impact on preparation strategy, cost and liability risk. When faced with an injury claim, it is therefore vital to identify as early as possible whether res ipsa may come into play. Often, there will be no prompt that it will. From experience, res ipsa is not always referenced in the letter of claim. So it is a case of reviewing the facts of the claim presented and considering whether the, the three conditions needed for res ipsa to apply are present. The three conditions as confirmed by case law are as follows. First, the accident must be of such a type that in the ordinary course of things it does not generally happen without negligence. Second, the injurious thing must be under the sole management and control of the defender. Third, the pursuer must not know and cannot reasonably be expected to know what caused the accident to happen. The legal test on paper does look reasonably clear, but its application to the facts is not always easy. Well-known scenarios of res ipsa are where a vehicle leaves the road or where an object falls from above. But outside of those scenarios, the determination of whether res ipsa applies can be difficult. When approaching the legal tests, I am mindful of the direction given by the English Court of Appeal in Smith versus Fordyce. The court there made clear that res ipsa is an evidential rule based on fairness and common sense. And it cautioned that it should be applied in that way. With that statement in mind, and to help you identify what could be a res ipsa case, the key features as I see them to look out for are, first, where the injury occurred without voluntary action on the part of the pursuer. Second, where the injury was caused by an instrument or appliance in exclusive management and control of the defender. Third, where the instrument or appliance would not ordinarily produce injury unless carelessly constructed, inspected or used. And finally, where evidence as to the cause of the accident is more accessible to the defender than to the pursuer. In terms of being more accessible, I mean that the facts which have a bearing on causation will not be known by the pursuer, but ought to be within the knowledge of the defender. I would propose running through this checklist when faced with a third party claim particularly when the facts do seem, do seem unusual. If the listed features are present, then res ipsa may apply. The question which then arises is what does that mean in practice for claim defence? In short, where res ipsa applies, the court will find for the pursuer unless the defender has cleared himself of negligence. To do so, the defender must prove either that A, the incident was due to a specific cause which does not connote negligence on its part but points to its absence as more probable or b if it is not possible to point to a specific non-negligent cause the defender must show that in the context of the accident circumstances it did use all reasonable care by way of example the inference was rebutted in smith versus fordyce 
Mr Fordyce had lost control of his vehicle and his passenger suffered a serious brain injury. However, his insurers were able to satisfy the court that he was not travelling at excessive speed. He had no reason to anticipate icy road conditions and he skidded on black ice which was not visible and could not reasonably have been foreseen. Overall, res ipsa is a rule of evidence which can be of considerable assistance to a pursuer and in turn can significantly increase liability risk to a defender. Being alive to its conditions of operation is vital and I do hope the checklist describes helps you to identify cases where it may come into play. If it is likely to apply, it will no longer be appropriate to wait and see what evidence the pursuer can produce. Instead, proactive investigation will be needed to identify whether the inference of fault is capable of being rebutted or not. So that takes us to the end of the five legal strands or topics. And I'll pass you back to Lynn to look at some conclusions and also to consider any questions. Thanks, Gemma. So to sum up, what we really hope that you take away from today's session is that when a claim is first presented, it might not be as straightforward as it appears at first glance. In any claim, it is crucial to establish the facts, as hopefully what you've heard from us today is that they really do inform the legal basis of the claim. Once you have the facts, you will then be in a position to assess the risks and your options. Whilst pursuers will often rely on the common law, there may be additional legal strands that they could rely upon that strengthen their case. They're not always included in the letter of claim, and indeed they're actually not always included in their initial pleadings when court actions are raised and can be introduced during adjustment periods. So it's important that we're aware of them so that we can assess the liability of the claim. Equally, there may be a basis to present a third party claim with a view to passing the liability onto another, or at least limiting the liability exposure. Even where primary liability is established, there can be an ability to seek contribution from another. Each case turns on its own facts and early investigation is key. So that takes us to the end of today's session and um, we have finished within the 35 minutes that we were planning so that's good it means we do have some time for questions so um, we've got a few here um, first one I can see Jim I think might be one that you want to take it's saying do we know when quarks are going to be coming into Scotland you might want to tell people what quarks are because they don't know and um, with, will that change how pursuers are presenting their case? Sure. So start date um, for qualified one-way cost shifting in Scotland is 30th of June this year. So I checked this morning, it's exactly seven weeks. Um, it will introduce um, what we, I think I like to say is no risk litigation in Scotland and that a pursuer will not be uh, subject to an adverse cost award provided they act reasonably. Now, that's a very highly low summary, but it kind of I think it covers the main point that it, there will be exceptions and we need to see how they develop over time. Um, the third part of your question, three parts, um, was how will it change how pursuers present their case? Um, I think it will change potentially how pursuers um, plead to make their cases. Um, I think there's a tendency to imagine that the cases may be presented in a less detailed and focused way. Um, and so the difficulty for defenders will be that the case against them might not be clear at the start. Um, I say that because um, with claims volumes potentially increasing, um, pursuers agents may take less time over drafting. And equally tactically, they might use um, lack of specification, so to speak, to try and elongate the claims process and to, to build cost. Um, in terms of how we can um, action against that. Um, we can take for, fair notice points with the court, obviously, as a procedural matter, but I think generally with, with quarks, it really does become more important than ever to consider the claim you receive on paper, but not just what you see on paper, to look beyond that and to consider how a claim might evolve over time, what the key legal arguments might be, and to assess them as early as possible with reference to investigations so that you can take a, a clear view soon on what the risk profile of the case may be, even if that case is not 
what's in front of you on the left of the plane or an initial rip, for example. Um, so we spoke earlier about goals, goals for today. Um, we said identification, application and response. And I think what's um, encapsulates all of those things. I think that's what we all need to be doing to try and limit spend um, going forward. I don't know about you, Lynn. I've just gone on a bit about quarks there, but maybe you've got something to add before time's up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose quarks is just a, a session in itself, isn't it? I think it's one of the big things that's coming down the track in a seven weeks that'll fly by. Um, so yeah, I suppose the other thing from quarks, the point of view is we know that it's going to make it more difficult in terms of recovering costs um, for defenders. Uh, and I suppose one of the key things is going to be how the exceptions play out in the courts, because we know there's going to be, we know the rules aren't here yet, but we know there's going to be an exception for fraud, um, but we don't know how that exception is really going to apply. And I suppose it's quite important to remember the test for fraud in Scotland is different to England and Wales. So we don't have the equivalent of fundamental dishonesty and that you know, the Scottish courts have confirmed that they are willing to compensate a uh, pursuer, even you know, no matter how exaggerated their claim is, if there's a genuine element to the claim, they're not going to dismiss it. So I think with that in mind, probably there is the potential for fraudulent claims to increase in Scotland once we've got quarks in, because the, the cost risk is gone, uh, given they can still recover the genuine element. So I think we probably are going to get a bit of a, a claim spike following the 1st of July. Um, I think actually you did a, an article on Cox, Jim, I can probably include that in the recording when we send that round after the event. Um, I'm happy to take any, any other questions on that um, in due course. Right, um, I think probably that actually takes us to the end um, to, of today. There are a couple of other questions we will follow up with people individually in relation to those um, so thank you again for joining today thanks for your time and um, hopefully we'll be able to see you in the not too distant future now restrictions are easing thanks very much thank you